now that we've talked about prejudice, we have to combine prejudice with privilege. Well, we have to define privilege as this idea of obtaining power or it's different paths or different roads to power. Not everybody has the same amount of roads to power, but you might have privilege in some ways and not in others. Privilege is the idea that historically your demographic groups have been able to own property. They have been able to incur money. They have been able to own large houses and to accumulate wealth. It's the idea that historically your demographic group has been allowed to vote and has been allowed to have laws shape and benefit them. And that historically your demographic group has been able to work outside the home and attain power in other groups. And so privilege can vary from culture to culture and across hundreds and thousands of years. In 2021, as I'm saying this in Canada, we have to acknowledge that for the last three or 400 years, one demographic group has held a lot of privilege. And that of course has been white straight men who have been well-educated and of English speaking background. And so they've had a lot of influence in the laws and in this construction of North American society. Now, privilege is something that can be really hard to talk about. But thanks to Peggy McIntosh, we have a word for it. And moving forward, we're able to identify when certain people seem to have these advantages. Now, just to give you some data to help support this, I want to show you the faces of the individuals that have been included in this unit. Certainly, there's some sort of privilege going on. Not all white guys are going to become eminent psychologists, but for some reason, white men have a much stronger chance of being talked about in intro psychology. If you don't believe me, and if you think this might just be a fluke to our social psychology unit, I happen to just open up my hard drive and import in all the pictures of all the eminent psychologists we have talked about since the beginning of Psych 200 last September. Now certainly there are women on this screen and there's even some individuals of color, but they are definitely the minority. This is showing us that, yeah, okay, maybe we can't do anything about the past, maybe we can't rewrite the history, but there definitely is something we can do moving forward. So happily, in our more advanced courses here in Psych, we are being a bit more representative, we are highlighting the contemporary groundbreaking work of women and minorities. But in intro psych, unfortunately, a lot of our work is to go over the classics. And we can see that in the history of psychology, we have a lot of individuals who maybe some are working class, maybe some are immigrants, maybe some grew up uh, in single parent homes and they all faced interesting obstacles of their own. But definitely there is a lot of individuals who made a mark in the history of intro psychology that have a lot of demographical similarities. Now, although everyone can have in-group and out-group perceptions and everyone can experience tribalism and xenophobia, we find that when prejudice is combined with privilege, that combination is what leads us to things like racism, sexism, homophobia, transphobia, and more. And it's the idea that some people believe that any race-based prejudice is racism but the way it's defined academically is not. So race-based prejudice is race-based prejudice, but race-based prejudice combined with power and privilege is racism. So it's only truly racism when it's coming from someone who has privilege. Race-based prejudice in the other direction is not racism. It's still prejudice and discrimination, but it's not racism. Let's say women are being prejudiced against men. That is still prejudice. That is still gender-based prejudice and gender-based discrimination. However, historically in Canadians history, women have not had more power and privilege than men. So that is not sexism versus because men have had historical power and privilege, a man having gender-based prejudice against women, that is sexism. So these are special words that we can only use when there is a combination of both prejudice and privilege. We can also see this within other groups. So within the black community, we know that individuals with lighter skin tones have historically had a bit more opportunity for power than people with darker skin tones within the black community. And so because of that, we can also see colorism play out. We can see that uh, within the black community, that privilege has fallen on people with lighter skin tones. So when they are prejudiced towards people in the black community with darker skin tones, that can still be colorism because it is the combination of prejudice and privilege. So these are special words we only use when there is a privilege and power differential in one direction, but not in the other direction. 
Now, am I saying that all white Christian men are extremely privileged? No. One thing we have to make clear is these are just past privilege. So privilege is something that doesn't block your barriers. It opens up doors. So not all individuals who have the doors open will actually be able to go through them. So you might be an individual who is a white male who feels like you are privileged. Maybe you grew up with a learning disability in a working class home with parents who had mental health issues and lots of addictions, and you felt like you had lots of barriers against you. That's very possible. But what we have to acknowledge is in this instance, you were privileged in the sense that your race was not something closing the doors for you. And your gender was not something closing your door for you. And your religion was not something closing doors for you. And your sexuality was not something closing doors for you. So those are four things not closing doors. Even though there were other things like learning disabilities, family economic status, mental health and substance abuse that were closing doors. So privilege is complicated. Some people can have privilege in some ways, but not in others. And so people are complex and privilege is the notion that there are some doors open. In the opposite sort of way, we can also talk about marginalization. And marginalization can be defined as barriers to power. Certainly, some people who are marginalized obtain power. We can think of Barack Obama and Oprah Winfrey, but it means that they are the exceptions to the rule. They've had lots of barricades and lots of barriers to power. And so marginalization is when power is barricaded from you, either institutionally or personally. And so this is the idea that historically the laws, the schools, the institutions of society have been set up in a way that they don't represent you and don't acknowledge what you need. And so we can see this in lots of different ways. We can think about this in terms of gender, ethnicity, religion, economic status. We can also see this in terms of your ability and physical abilities and mental abilities. We can think about this in terms of your sexual orientation. Quite honestly, it's limitless. And we as a society are learning more and more and more about these different barriers and the ways that our laws have not captured and represented at all individuals. It's important to understand that marginalization is intersectional. And it's the idea that a person who has many different barriers is different than a person who only experiences one barrier. For instance, let's talk about the white woman who's well-educated, Christian, and straight. She's going to have very few barriers and lots of roads to privilege. In comparison to a queer black woman who's disabled, there's going to be a lot more barriers. And so this sometimes gets a little bit conflated and people think they're supposed to count their barriers or that you can add up and determine who's more marginalized than not. But we can't really quantify how intensely these barriers are. Or we don't really have the language or the science to support that yet. And it's important to just acknowledge that marginalization is real and marginalization is something that happens and blocks us from power. Now, someone who's marginalized can still get privileged and someone who is historically privileged can still feel marginalized. And, but the way that prejudice works is when prejudice is coming from someone who's privileged to someone who's marginalized, because that privilege has the power, that is when it can influence laws and it can influence the way schools are run and it can influence society and become more harmful to those people who are marginalized. And that's why prejudice coming from that top-down approach is something we tend to study more often because it can be things like influence our police forces. It can be things like influence how our foster care system works. And that can be much more impactful. 